Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, I have this privilege uh, from EWTN to enter into your homes and to bring to you uh, someone who, because of their love for Jesus Christ, was drawn home to the fullness. And uh, it's a nice privilege tonight. I actually have a friend, a, a local friend, uh, joining me tonight, Janet Schmidtkin. And she's a convert from the Polish National Church. It's not a church you hear of a lot, so we'll hear a little bit more in a moment about her own journey. But uh, Janet, welcome to Journey Home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be here. It's good to, good to have you uh, come through the, green, the big snowstorm to make it to the studio. <laughs> Thank you for, for joining us. It's good to finally get you on the program and to hear about your journey. Let me get out of the way, as I usually do, and invite you to start way back at the beginning and let us hear a bit of your journey. Okay. Well, my journey started. Um, I was born on February 14th, Valentine's Day in 1961 at Sacred Heart Hospital in Allentown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, I was baptized into the Polish National Catholic Church and uh, um, grew up with that faith. Um, had a kind of chaotic childhood. My dad was an alcoholic. He was Polish National Catholic, and he was an alcoholic. My mom was um, Evangelical Lutheran, Windish Lutheran. And um, so, and she had a lot of, uh, she suffered with mental illness. Mm. So I had kind of a rough childhood. Wow. Yeah. In spite of that, um, I had two really good godparents in my life. My dad's brother, my Uncle Jay, was my godfather, and he was Polish National Catholic, and he took me to church every week, hmm. and uh, sometimes my family too. And so um, he was a real source of stability in my life. Um, I'm wondering my, if maybe, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, some of the audience may not know anything about the Polish National Church. Is this a good time maybe? Where's it come from? You know, What's sure. the history there? A little bit of, because you're talking about a part of Pennsylvania that would have attracted a lot of workers right. from Europe. Right, and it was a, that's when all of our relatives had come over. It was a very ethnic area of Eastern Europeans and just kind of a little melting pot. It was be right. beautiful. Um, so the church around the turn of the last century, uh, around 1895, 1897, um, there started to be disagreements when some of the Polish people uh, came to America, and um, there, you know, there weren't very many Polish priests yet, and um, so we would have these Polish congregations, and some of them were Polish, but they weren't allowed to speak the language in the church for mass, and um, oftentimes uh, some of their pastors were. Uh, either German or Irish, which was difficult right. and didn't understand, uh, especially the Polish people's customs. Um, and because uh, Polish people had a lot of customs with their church. Right. And so um, they um, wanted, and, and again, this is part of where the labor movement was and in the Industrial Revolution, people wanted a little more autonomy uh, over um, their uh, church, you know, not only their jobs, but their church. And so it was kind of um, a break off because of that and because, and it was, uh, especially with the authority of the church um, and, yeah. and the Pope, so it was a struggle. Yeah, I think most, most of us don't realize to what extent this, this struggle was there from the beginning of Catholicism in America, mm -hmm. because at the end of the 18th century, when we received, we got our first bishop, John Carroll, uh, he himself was a, 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 a suppressed Jesuit at the time, but the, what Catholics there were, there were no priests. They were either ex-Jesuits, mm -hmm. or they were coming from the French Revolution, or they were Irish or German. One of the first breakaways in the Catholic Church was a group of German Catholics in I think it was Philadelphia or Baltimore with the same exact issue. There was no German priest, so it was an Irish priest or a French right. priest. No one speaking the, the languages and And that issue began to resolve itself after a time when there were there started to be Polish priests. Right. And um, and then uh, so a priest named uh, Fra uh, Father Francis Hoder, he in 1897 
um, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, they asked him to be a part of and to break away. There were, it was, you know, there were some rough times. There were some riots, uh, police yeah. involved. Uh, it happened in Chicago, I believe, Buffalo, um, and, um, and then in Scranton. And it was over church finances and stuff, too. People worked hard and, you know, didn't see where their money was going in the church. So, but, um, Bishop or uh, Father Hoder became a bishop in I believe it was 1905, and it was uh, he was consecrated through the old Catholic Church in Holland. Um, so that was and and we knew that growing up. Um, so um, it was a beautiful church to grow up in. There was a lot of tradition involved, um, and it was very much like Catholic Mass, um, same belief in the Eucharist. Um, the saints were not quite as uh, prevalent um, in, we prayed, but not to individual saints per se. Um, confession was a little different. There was a general confession for adults rather than private confessions. I guess you could always go to private confession, yeah. but that was more a for A bit more like children. what's in the Lutheran church in your, in your right, mother's background. Right. It, it, there was a lot of beautiful traditions. He did benediction to the Blessed Sacrament. And so I remember all this growing up. Um, also, as I was growing up, the church became real important to my life. I began to go to the youth group and the youth choir on Saturdays. And so we had a youth group. We sang Polish songs and learned them, and we had a choir director. They were wonderful people, but she insisted that we get every word pronounced exactly right. So I can sing you those songs right now. I know them all. Uh, but they're beautiful songs, and beautiful songs about the faith, and beautiful songs about Mary. And um, so those always remain in my heart. We also did Polish folk dance, which was really beautiful, yeah. uh, just the dances were just so beautiful and each told a story. And every once in a while we would have Polish lessons and our priest would teach us a little bit of Polish. <laughs> and um, I, I know a little bit of that, so. Well, again, that's one of the beauties of, uh, on the one hand, it's one of the beauties of the Catholic faith and the ethnic churches. It also can be a confusion for people outside because it's kind of like the infant of Prague, for example. Um, you mm -hmm. know, if you don't know the history and the culture and the ethnic background of that, and here you are in America with this and you're not a Catholic, I mean, what's this all about? You just don't quite, because those devotions and songs have a huge history that touches people's hearts if mm -hmm. you're in that culture exactly. and that ethnic. And that was one of the, one of the beautiful things was, and, and strange things, was that growing up, I knew that I was different than a lot of my Catholic friends. Most of our, you know, our family and, and our friends were Catholic. And so, um, and some of my relatives' best friends were, went to the Polish Catholic Church. And uh, so it was kind of, uh, you know, a little bit different. I think there was a lot of pride that went along with that when I was uh, younger, mm -hmm. especially of, you know, being different. Um, and, uh, but, uh, Anyway, I knew that I always felt closer to Catholics and, and a lot of my Catholic friends. When you look back on your childhood, do you, did you yourself, as a result of those experiences, have a relationship with Christ? I did, but I was kind of a little precocious and I questioned things. I remember questioning and doing a little sermon for some of my relatives about whether God existed or not. So um, I did begin to question. Plus, it was, like I said, we had a very chaotic life yeah. in our family. And it was because of the church and it was because of um, our extended family who who really and you know even school and teachers and stuff who really helped to stabilize that but as i moved on when i was a teenager i was still going to youth group and everything and that was still part of my life but that was during the 70s and it was a very me generation mm. and i bought into a lot of those lies um coming from a family background of alcoholism, I began to drink myself. Um, so it was kind of a painful and confusing time. Interesting, my mom 
was Lutheran, an evangelical Lutheran, but she went to the Polish Catholic, National Catholic Church. Um, she, I don't know, she never converted, but I know that she did have Eucharist in the church. So I don't, and I don't have any information about that. What was interesting is that when I became a teenager and rebelled, I wouldn't say the creed because I didn't understand the words and I didn't understand, you know, why it said Catholic. And the second thing is that I refused to go to Eucharist sometime. Well, I know now why I didn't go to Eucharist. It was because of my own sin. But my mom would always prod me in the pew and say, are you going to go to communion? And so I knew it was heartfelt and deep for her. She yeah. came from a very um, evangelical Christian or Lutheran background, but it was very much like the Catholic Church. And it was also from a part of Slovenia now where that church came. And it was one of the first places um, that was uh, that became Lutheran hmm. and broke yeah. away from the church. So it has a lot of deep roots. So for your mother, maybe the issue wasn't so much Lutheran and Catholic as it was Slovenian and Polish. Any of these ethnics? Yeah, I think it was actually connection. both. It yeah. was, it, you know, it was a mixed marriage, and at that time, um, and my dad had been divorced, so there were oh. a lot of uh, uh, it, there were a lot of family issues because of that. Definitely. So in uh, in high school, when you're starting to plant your wild oats there, uh, did it did it pretty well take you from the church at the time? What happened? At, it, at it did. I mean, I continued to go to, to church, um, and my friends were there. Um, but, you know, once I hit the point where uh, I, w I was very driven to go to college and to be successful and to leave my life behind, and I was going to have the perfect life, <laughs> and <laughs> because I was so much smarter than you know, my my friend, my um, family, and and all those old people with their old customs, and at so least she thought you were. At least I thought I was, <laughs> and so uh, I was very driven to go to college. And of course, you know, being in the Polish National Catholic Church, uh, I had an automatic excuse not to go to mass because there weren't hardly any parishes. So um, I did not. Church was not a part of my life. Uh, in college, and you know, I continued to to drink, and I continued to have um, be far from God in a lot of ways. Something very important happened to me at that point in the journey, though. I went to um, a school in Philadelphia for pharmacy at Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and in 1979. Uh, pope John Paul II came to the United States mm -hmm. and came to Philadelphia. Well, most of my friends were Catholic, and everybody was getting tickets to go see the Pope. So I went along with all my friends, and we got tickets from one of the local churches to see the Pope. And um, I, I knew I loved him because he was Polish, and a lot <laughs> of the Polish National Catholics, of course, loved John Paul II. Uh, and I knew there was a connection there, uh, but I can't tell you, I was far from God, so I can't tell you what he said, but I do know that he prayed for everyone there, and I, I, that was one of the seeds of my conversion. Um, I have a deep love for John Paul II. Yeah, yeah. The, I'm wondering if part of the history of the Polish National Church was um, a reaction to the de declaration of papal infallibility in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah, uh, I, th I think that definitely had to do with it, although I don't know the exact details yet. Well, the reason I mention that is, and there, you know, there is the, the deep-seated hesitancy to uh, give allegiance to the Pope uh, and to the rest of the Catholic Church that's in allegiance with the Pope. Um, my guess is that that's, that was a part of the underlying uh, uh, convictions of the, of the church, whether it seeped into you or not, because you said they loved John Paul, but they weren't Catholic yet. They right. Were, they were keeping their distance. Right. Well, and, you know, the heart is really important to a lot of Polish people, and a lot of Poli we've had our struggles, and so we understand uh, the borders were yeah. <laughs> optional <laughs> throughout a lot of history. Yeah. And so th I think there's a lot of history in that, too. 
Uh, so, but I think that brought people closer, uh, John Paul II's papacy. So you come away with the Pope praying for you. Did, did, did that start your journey? Uh, not quite. I took a long time. <laughs> um, I went, I transferred to Ohio State and um, I met um, my future husband there, Tom, and uh, we started dating and Tom was raised Catholic. Um, not close to God, though, at the yeah. time. And, uh, but as, you know, we began dating and everything, and then eventually we decided that we would get married. And, uh, uh, you know, I continued to have kind of, uh, be far away from God, and I think Tom was too. Here's where another interesting thing happens. So we were of course, there's no Polish National Catholic Church. I think there was one in Cleveland, but I didn't go far enough to investigate. Uh -huh. And of course, I was very rebellious and I was pretty anti-Catholic. And so um, when we were going to get married, I decided that uh, we were going to church shop and see. And my mother-in-law could probably tell this part of the story a little better than I could, <laughs> but um, I don't remember some of it. But um, my mother-in-law, who you know has her own struggles with the church she was adamant about us getting married in the catholic church and she said you must get married in the church and at the time i didn't really like that too much but we did go to see the priests um i was still anti-catholic the priest was very nice man but when he met me and found out i was polish national catholic he said oh i've heard about him but i've never met one in person <laughs> and so he was a little brash um but I thank my mother-in-law now for insisting. And I think a lot of times parents are afraid to stand up when their kids don't go to church or their kids are losing the faith. And I think that was so important. And I'm so um, happy that we got married in the church. We didn't have a mass because, you know, a lot of my relatives weren't Catholic. And so, um, but it was beautiful and... Um, was Tom wanting to get married in the church? Was he just willing he, to go along? He didn't. I don't think it made a whole lot of difference to him okay. um, right. back then. I think he would have probably went along with what I said, but I think he was probably happy. Something really interesting happened before we got married in the marriage mm -hmm. preparation. We took pre cana seriously. And uh, we still have all the letters we wrote to each other. Uh, and a lot of the things have come true. It's beautiful and it's very important. But something that happened, I could tell you exactly where it happened. I was on a drive home back to Columbus from, um, I don't know if it was after we had met with the priest, but it was during our marriage preparations. And I remember having the thought that I wanted God to be a part of our lives. And I was still far from God. But I knew that I wanted God to be a part of our lives. So we're still not Catholic. We're still going. We started to go to church. We started to go to Newman Center. Um, I got pregnant with my first son. And um, I think I started, well, I can't even remember exactly when I started RCIA, but I eventually started RCIA at Newman Center. Newman Center was a nice, easy fit for yeah. me at the time. Yeah. Um, and my son got baptized at Newman Center. And so even though it was hard for me to sign those papers when we were going through our marriage preparation, because I had to agree to raise our children Catholic. And I said, I don't know if I can do that. And the priest was very pastoral, <laughs> should we say, <laughs> about it and explained it to me. But there was no question that it, we would baptize him Catholic. And so we did. Um, I went through the RCIA program. Right before Easter Vigil, we were going to move to California. And I don't think I was ready to be Catholic yet, so that was just fine with me. So I didn't become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. We moved to California and uh, had my second son. Had, had Tom been gone? To, had, had he returned to his faith? No. No, okay, so no, Tom's he not was gone. still very far so from his faith. So as a couple, you're, there's really no momentum no, we to church, be involved. No, yeah. we church shopped yeah. a little bit, and we knew, you know, we lived in Dayton for a little bit. We went to... Uh, different churches, right. he, like a Lutheran church that was more fire and brimstone, at least that's how we felt at the time. So, but 
Um, no, we were no. both far. So you head out to California. We move out to California, and I was pregnant with my second son, uh, Evan, and I had my son out there um, two weeks after we moved. I needed to, I'm a pharmacist, and so my husband was going to be a postdoc out there, and so I knew that I needed to find a job. <laughs> um, I had already had my license, and so when after my son was born, um, we went I went to a uh, Catholic hospital out there because I'd worked in hospital pharmacy, and it was Santa Teresita Hospital in Duarte, California. And I went there, and Evan was on my, I had a little pack with him in it, and he was right on, on my chest there, and we went into the hospital so I could fill out a resume in those days. <laughs> and uh, I was instantly welcomed in to, uh, they needed a pharmacist, um, and so I was hired almost on the spot. Um, one of the other uh, workers in the pharmacy had a baby, baby too, so our babies were right at the same age. So, so I began to work there in May of 1992. Another really important thing happened to me there. In May of 1992, when I started, uh, there was a priest, a, it, first I have to tell you, it was run by the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles. Do you start to see a pattern with the Sacred Heart? <laughs> um, the, they were just wonderful sisters. Um, there was a Jesuit priest there named Father John Houle. Uh, Father John Houle had been in, in a missionary in China during the Cultural Revolution. He was imprisoned um, and uh, had it very rough. Um, it's got a wonderful story. Anyway, Father Houle was kind of retired at the hospital in the grounds there and lived there in residence. And he, um, at the time, uh, got a fatal lung disease. And uh, he was miraculously cured through the intercession of, Saint, of Blessed Claude de la Colombière. Um, blessed, because of this intercession, it was deemed mm. a miracle. And so Blessed Claude de la Colombière became Saint Claude de la Colombière <laughs> and, uh, by John Paul II on May 30th, 1992. And Father Houle attended uh, his canonization wow. mass. At that canonization, um, during this time, John Paul II blessed this rosary, which Father Houle gave me as a gift um, for helping him with his medicine or something. But um, it was really special. I didn't understand that we had huge posters of the miracle. I didn't understand what was going on. Yeah, I'm wondering, are you... Are you are you growing more faithful at that time, or is it still just, I don't understand this, but it's good stuff happening around? Yeah, we started to go to Mass sometimes at the Catholic Church, but I had an excuse because I had two little ones and sure. it was difficult, I thought, to go to church. Um, the sisters were a wonderful influence, and they told my husband privately that they prayed for me. Um, all the other people at the hospital were just wonderful. And there was a special man there who was also part of my journey. His name's uh, Tom Considine. And uh, he would uh, volunteer at our pharmacy. He was an older gentleman, and he volunteered at our pharmacy. And he would um, go to adoration in the middle of the night and somewhere in Los Angeles, I think it was downtown. And then he would come into the pharmacy, and he would bring us donuts and bagels, chocolate bagels, <laughs> and um, we just, I, it, he was just a wonderful person, and his wife was wonderful too, and they were very much part of the community at Santa Teresita. Um, he had four sons, three of them died of cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. and he had a very strong faith. So he was, he and his wife were just such a witness to mm -hmm. me of their love, and they were very kind to us. Um, he. I didn't understand what adoration was, and I didn't understand what he was right. doing, but it planted another seed of, you know, his great love. All right. 
So you've landed in California, you got a couple kids, you're a welcome, welcoming Catholic community, good models in there. You don't, it doesn't sound like you're quite getting it yet, but the seeds are kind of breaking through. No, my thought process was very far from God. In fact, I can just think of some of the things that I probably talked about and said in front of the sisters. Um, <laughs> they were so kind to my children and they were so good to our family. And they, it was, and they had so much fun. I mean, they would have, we'd have like little, um, events there like Christmas tree sale or bazaars and they would rent um, a Pope mobile and one of the actors <laughs> who played the Pope, he was, I think he was on Johnny Carson, uh, he would come and uh, be a part of the festivities and ride around in his Pope mobile and he really did look like Pope John Paul II. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. They were a lot of fun and I got to know some of them and their stories, they're just beautiful um, uh, women. You mentioned the Sacred Heart, which will be a big part of your the story, but was the Sacred Heart at all a part of Polish Catholic tradition? Catholic tradition? It, uh, were, you, were you aware of it? What did it mean to you at that time? You know, it, uh, we didn't do devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the church, but I can tell you that it was a part of our lives and we had Sacred Heart pictures around. Um, I found in my prayer book some stamps of the Sacred Heart. Uh, whenever someone would die, um, they were given um, a um, mass for the Sacred Heart and, and inducted into yeah. the Sacred Heart. So um, what happened with the sisters, though, was um, when we were getting to leave California, the sisters gave me this little pack and inside was some holy water and inside was a rosary, and inside was a little pack about enthroning Jesus, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, into your home and the consecration of the family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I thought, oh, those cute little sisters, they're so sweet to give us this. But I looked at it and it looked foreign. I had no idea what it was <laughs> and what the devotion was about. And I think I tried reading about it, but I didn't understand. So I put that away. Uh, we moved from California, we moved to Washington State. The kids were getting older, so it was time to start being serious about going to church. And so we church shopped again, um, but my husband said the Catholic Church felt like home, and so we started to go to the Catholic Church. All right, why don't we pause there, Jan, it's a good place. Our guest is Janet Schmidtkin, and we'll, we'll pause there because uh, we were going to come back and find out a little bit more about the Sacred Heart also because our non-Catholic audience particularly is going to have, some of them have the same feeling you do towards that, well, what is all that about? Seems foreign. You know, how, how does that bring me to Jesus? And we'll talk about that later in the program. Let's take a break. Back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grody, your host, and our guest is Janet Schmidtkin. And uh, she, uh, her journey is from the Polish National Catholic Church. So you've, you've journeyed from, from Ohio to California and Washington. You still haven't stumbled across a Polish National Church yet. That's <laughs> no. convenient. <laughs> no. uh, what's more convenient is you have a, a, a husband that's a former Catholic, and, and you've agreed to bring up your children Catholic, though that's not that big of a thing. But you've had the seeds planted. Mm -hmm. by those uh, wonderful sisters at the hospital. So you head up north to Washington. We lived in Pullman, Washington, and uh, when we were there, we joined a Catholic church. And it was time for the kids to start going to uh, PSR and get their sacraments. So my son was five years old, and uh, we went to Sacred Heart church in Pullman, Washington. <laughs> and so uh, there's more of a pattern here. Um, I started, I began to go through RCIA again, and it was a good time for me to go through. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, we learned a lot of good things about church history. Um, I kind of looked over the schedule, and I think this time I was ready 
um, to become Catholic. And uh, it was just a wonderful group of people who I went through RCIA with and a wonderful group of sponsors. Uh, Tom sponsored me into the Catholic Church, um, and which is really interesting because I became his catechist later, uh, as he says. But um, it was just beautiful. And one of the most beautiful things about it was 1997 Easter Vigil, May 20 or Mar March 29th, 1997. And one of the most beautiful things I remember about the Easter Vigil was that my son was in the back of the church, my uh, youngest, Evan, and he was like five years old at the time. And everybody had candles, and I was really nervous about him having that candle. <laughs> but um, after I became Catholic, he gave me a hug, and he said, now you're a part of our family. <laughs> And I still remember that, and I get choked up at it. It was just so beautiful um, coming from him. Um, but um, my son Evan was extra wiggly, let's say, growing up. And because of that, uh, I had to start attending PSR, <laughs> and I became one of his teachers in PSR, um, which started a whole new experience for say, me. <laughs> You can't give what you ain't got. Right. And so it was so beautiful because, you know, still, when I went through RCIA, some of the things were so foreign to me. And I, you know, our ears aren't always ready to hear and to listen, and our hearts aren't always ready to absorb it all. And so um, I started to teach RCIA from first grade on, and I started to move up with Evan. And I taught with some wonderful people. And um, I started to learn, even teaching at you know a third grade level, second grade level, I started to learn so much about the church and the history of the church. And so we eventually moved from Washington, <laughs> we moved back to Ohio again <laughs> and made a big circle. And uh, this time we weren't church shopping. We went to the church in our community, and we're, we were ready to join and ready. Um, now, Tom's heart still wasn't. It was still kind of far away from his faith, but we were getting closer, hmm. and I was getting closer. We moved to Ohio. Our children were a little bit older and uh, ready. I wanted them to get involved in church. I wanted them to get involved. They had already had their sacraments. They had confirmation in fifth grade out in uh, Spokane Diocese. So uh, that wasn't a question. It was a question of just them learning their faith. And so, uh, and our children weren't the easiest to get to go to church sometimes. <laughs> and so it was a struggle. Uh, but um, and they weren't like my perfect boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult, uh, which it is for a lot of families. But we started to go to church and as family. Um, again, I would work as pharmacist some of the weekends when I would work, I think it was one weekend a month. It was my husband's turn to take them to church. And uh, he didn't always do that, and it was a point of contention between us. <laughs> And so uh, one day he didn't take them to church, and they woke up and they were bears to get out of bed. Um, and they woke up and it was too late to go to mass. And they looked at him and they said, Dad, why didn't you wake us up to go to church? And his heart began to turn then. Hmm. Another thing that was very important in our journey was our community at the church. I wanted my boys to be a part of youth ministry. And so I pushed, and sometimes you have to push them when they're teenagers to go to some of the things. <laughs> of course. Um, that became a big part of our family, and again, I began to chaperone for youth ministry. And boy, did I learn a lot through that. We were surrounded by a community of wonderful people, and still are, uh, who are such a part of our family, and um, the the young people and that my kids were friends with and that I'm friends with now, such an important part of our journey. And I could see their love and going to the youth diocese events and NCYC, the National Catholic Youth Conference, 
you know, it just builds your faith. It's there I was at one of in Salesian Center in Columbus for one of the youth uh, diocesan youth rallies, and it's completely dark and there's adoration, and there's like I don't know. 20 some priests at least, maybe more, all lined up on this dark gymnasium and we're writing down our sins and I'm terrified of going to confession and my son pops up and says, mom, aren't you going? And I see all these young people in line, how could I not go? <laughs> it was a hard time for our family. My son struggled with um, some mental issues and, and learning disability and um, Going to confession, the priest was just so loving and pastoral and always gave me such good advice in confession. And the priest there uh, was just a special blessing that day. So the other part is our community. We joined Teams of Our Lady, um, and which um, is just a beautiful marriage ministry. And um, our team has been together about eight years now. And we've just, there's four other couples, um, or three, four couples, and uh, three others with us. And we have a young priest, uh, Father Michael Hindersheet is our spiritual advisor. And it's just a wonderful monthly journey. <laughs> uh, and we eat dinner together, we pray together, uh, we have readings, we read spiritual books about the church and, and grow in our faith. Was Our Lady always a part of your journey? Because I'm assuming it was a part of the devotions of the of the Polish National Church, of course. It was, but not a big part. I mean, it it was in some ways, but um, I, I guess I still had some, you know, issues uh, with that. But as I've grown into my faith. Um, I have more of a devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, along with yeah. the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, so by this time in your journey, when you're with Teens of Our Lady, which is when, when my wife Marilyn and I met you at mm -hmm. um, the the Sacred Heart of, of, of Jesus and, and the Heart of Mary were a part of your devotion. I wonder if, let's say that somebody's listening and hasn't a clue what we're talking about with the Sacred Hearts. Well, how would you describe them? How do they bring you close to Jesus? Well, I will tell you, so we were having, still having family difficulties oh, okay. about this time. And so I finally got that little packet out and I um, looked at it and I started to read it about the enthronement. And I said, okay, I, and it was very stressful, moving. Uh, we had a lot of issues, it, you know, family issues. It was hard, difficult raising, um, you know, teenage boys and stuff. and. Um, my son was having learning disabilities. So I got that packet out and I said, okay, we're gonna do this enthronement. So we did it as a family and we read the prayers. Uh, we made up our own enthronement. I didn't know exactly know. I took a picture from one of my parents' funerals. Uh, they had both passed away by this time. And I just, um, we all signed it. We all said the prayers together and our hearts began to change. That was May, March 1st, 2006. And so, and I still didn't understand a lot about the enthronement process and Sacred Heart of Jesus, but the promises come true. It was a devotion that was given by Jesus to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, who was um, a visitation a nun in France. And there were 12 promises that were put together that were thought would be good spiritual direction for most people. And so there's meant much more to it than that, but it's about Jesus' love and mercy yeah. and how Jesus wants our hearts and how Jesus wants us to love his heart uh, in the representation of his love for us and his mercy for us. It's, it's connected to divine mercy. It's connected to Fatima. Uh, it's just a beautiful way. So that was part of our journey, and then, and, and then as time went on, um, I wanted to find a way of doing more with the Sacred Heart of Jesus, because as time goes on, you just start to love more and more. Yeah. Um, the Sacred Heart, Jesus' love and Jesus' Sacred Heart is what I believe brought my husband back into the church, too. Yeah. 
uh, in a more full, full way. And um, a few years ago, went to a women's uh, conference in Diocese of Columbus, and they had a speaker about the Sacred Heart, and I was very excited about it. And I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what. Well, comes that October, there was a Congress for the Sacred Heart in Columbus. And uh, it's Missionaries of the Sacred Heart and uh, Sacred Heart Columbus. And so they um, started a group to enthrone homes. Father oh. Stash Daly is our spiritual director for the group. And Chuck and Joanne Wilson right. uh, head We've up been the, on the program. <laughs> yes, uh, they're wonderful, and they have headed up this apostolate. And so we have teams. We I think we started out with 20, 26 teams, and now it's growing. But we have teams that go out to people's houses, and we bring the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a picture of Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary. We do prayers. Uh, we say a rosary. We do a litany of the Sacred Heart. We explain what the devotion is. And then uh, they pray for a week. And then we come back a week later and we enthrone the pictures in a place of honor in their home. It's a way of bringing Jesus into your home and family. Even the power of just that picture that Jesus commissioned uh, yeah. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque to have done of his Sacred Heart to be adored. In, um, to, and to be enthroned in people's hearts and to, into people's homes. But even just the picture of Jesus is powerful, just having a picture, but it's so much more than that. It's growing in love for Jesus and wanting others to have that love and to, under, and to love Jesus. It's just yeah, a beautiful it, devotion. Our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, because of uh, a lack of formation on icons and pictures and statues. You know, the resistance there. They don't. They may not quite get the artwork of the Sacred Heart. But it's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's about: an intimacy and and a, a relationship with His Mother, who prays for us and leads us to Him, points to Him. That's what it really what it's about. Our and, hearts are so hardened. And uh, so many times, and even some of us in the Catholic Church, our hearts are so hardened, and this helps soften our hearts, and it, it can create, there's so many families who struggle with, you know, children not going to church or other family members not going to church. Um, some of their friends are falling away, uh, Catholics or, you know, even other Christians. This is a way of of Jesus helping to soften people's hearts. Yeah, and I, all, all the years that we've done this program, it's amazing how often the, the guest will, will recognize after they've come into the church that they recognize that part of the reasons for that was someone had been praying for them. Mm -hmm. You talk about those sisters out in California. Oh yeah, I have, we have been so blessed because there's so many people who have prayed for us along the way, and I'm sure, especially the Carmelite sisters, and I still have different connections to them. Um, yeah. But there's so many people who've prayed for us, and, and even in our church community, how many people, and and it's just, our, our faith is so beautiful, and our faith is so, it's so wonderful, and it's so wonderful to be able to pray for other people. Being a pharmacist has really influenced me because I get to hear a lot of people's stories. Uh, being involved in our faith has influenced me, and I love to hear people's mm -hmm. stories. But um, because I've heard so many people's stories and because um, I just wear my heart on my sleeve, I, I can kind of read people's hearts sometimes. And uh, that's really important is for us to tell our stories. Yeah, that's been a, a part of your uh, apostolate, if you would, after, after coming home to the right. church. Right. One of the things that I enjoy doing, I do something called a Women's Summit. And it's a little talk, and it's for uh, women of all ages. And so sometimes it's at my house, sometimes it's at a church. I have uh, sometimes teenagers there, uh, and I said, we'll take teenagers up to 102. <laughs> and so we've got a mixture of women uh, come over, and I talk to them and start telling them stories and parts of my story, and how to tell stories and how to tell our story to help build their faith and the people in um, their circle 
their faith and the importance of that storytelling. And that's the importance of passing our faith on to the younger generations. And it's so beautiful to see, particularly the young women, and then you know the older women will tell stories too, but it helps the young women to learn what they need to do and what, they, what kind of story they wanna have for their lives and how they wanna raise their families. Oh, I look back when, when I was a, a non-Catholic youth minister and often uh, very committed to evangelization and many of the young people that we brought into our youth fellowship were Catholics that we pulled away from the church. Mm -hmm. And it, it was as if we were closing the sale on these young people because no one had shared their journey with them. And that's what you're talking about. Share your story with right, them. Right. I talked about teaching PSR, and youth ministry and PSR are so important. And one of the really important things about it is that um, it, in youth ministry is is for people to know their faith and in PSR to get for children to get the meat of the faith. I teach fifth grade and I love fifth grade because they are just learning and they don't have all the answers yet and they haven't seen some of the hardships of life, but in the next few years they're gonna see some of the struggles that they may have or their friends may have. And so I think it's so important to take our faith seriously and to teach our young people uh, the real meat of the faith and, and to love their faith. A verse comes to mind. First Peter 3, 15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence and keep your conscience clear. That seems to be a verse that kind of talks about what you're helping people to do to tell their story, to give a reason for the hope that is in them. Right, and even if your story is not perfect, um, I, I didn't talk about miracles, but there's many miracles that have happened along the way. Um, and some of our family and friends, they just look at us, <laughs> look at me now. And, but uh, one of the miracles was my dad got sober at the age of 70, and it was through God. Wow. And it was through me asking God, say, I don't know what to do about this, but if I'm supposed to do something, you have to make it real clear to me. And two weeks later, my dad got sober. Um, so even if you struggle with some of these slaveries of addictions, and um, it, Jesus wants your heart, and, and there's a way out, um, and there's a way into the church. We have an email, Joe from Nevada writes, my wife and I have several small children. We have recently decided to begin attending mass again and make our faith more of a priority. How do you suggest we begin forming our children and teaching them about the Catholic Church? Hang out with other Catholics who love their faith. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our friends are so beautiful, and I've met the most amazing people um, in the church, in our church, and then in the people all around Columbus and people around the country and the world, Catholics. and. Uh, Make it fun. There's so many good authors out there now. There's so many good books. There's so many good Catholic shows. There's EWTN, which is another part of my journey I didn't get to talk about. But there's so many good things that are out there. Uh, and uh, keep your community close to the church. You mentioned EWTN, and, and sometimes I, I do want to make sure you mention because we want to make sure that what we're doing through EWTN reaches out to folk. I mean, from your experience, did it have a positive influence on you? It definitely did uh, from two sources that were really uh, different. I, I didn't know what EWTN was, but um, my mother-in-law would always talk about Mother Angelica and she would tell me stories about her. And you know, my mother-in-law is, is not you know, a regular churchgoer. And so uh, she would say, what happened to her and stuff? So then it kind of got my curiosity. Another thing that happened was my Aunt Elsie, who was my godmother, and she's 93 years old now, and uh, 
she watches EWTN every day. And so when we began to go back to Pennsylvania and visit after my parents passed away, uh, she would always have mass on and she is a huge fan of Marcus Grothei <laughs> <laughs> and the journey home. <laughs> of the guests, of, <laughs> of the guests. They're the ones that are the, are, the, uh, are, are the focus of this program, of course. We have another email, Jeffrey from the South writes, what are some methods that the average Catholic can employ to help share his faith and make the Catholic Church more appealing to people in the modern age? Tell the stories of our faith. Um, tell the stories and of real people in our faith and uh, just to watch people and become watchers of people and, and to observe how people live their lives. Um, some of the people that I've met in the Catholic Church, and, and my other Christian friends too, but there's such a depth of their faith uh, in yeah. the church. You know, I was thinking, as you said earlier, there's so many resources that are now available in the church, but often we'll get the question, you know, I've got such and such, and I want to give them a book. What's a good book? Well, it's like, whoa, how do you mm -hmm. answer that question? So, you know, how do you share the faith is a question the person was asking. You need to know that person better Be in your relationship. Right. Was it in that you begin to discover what is it that might be the particular resource for that person? And then if you know the resources, then they connect. Oh, yeah, this book I read would be the perfect one for this person. Oh, yeah. And just keep learning about your faith. And it's not so much giving people books, although I, I love to pass out books. Uh, <laughs> it's not so much giving people books, but telling them stories and building a relationship with people. Very good. Another email, Tyler from Missouri. I've heard the phrase, the new evangelization in my parish and in my reading of Catholic material. I'm curious as to whether Janet has any practical suggestions as to how we can foster it better in our families and communities. Oh, absolutely, I'm passionate about this. Well, um, the, one of my favorite uh, works of art is in the uh, Basilica in Washington, D.C., the National Shrine of uh, Immaculate Conception. And in the back of the church, there is a beautiful um, mural relief of uh, the new evangelization. And uh, if you ever get to Washington, D.C., I invite everyone to go there. <laughs> but uh, there's so many things that we can do. And uh, it's, it's about John Paul II's theology of the, the importance of the family and the cells of the church and those little groups in the church and becoming involved and in learning more about your faith. All right. Um, teams of Our Lady, you know, what about marriages? What, what's your suggestions for people that had a struggle like you and Tom? went through what you went through? Oh, well, there was a point in our marriage when we were really struggling, and I said, Tom, I said, he does science research, he does cancer research, and I said, Tom, I said, in your job and in your research, would you hang out with scientists who were kind of shoddy and not good? And he's like, no. And I said, well, I said, I said, we need to start hanging out with people who have strong marriages and good marriages. And he said, I don't know anybody with a strong marriage. And that really cut me to the heart. And so Teams of Our Lady became an important thing. It took me a while to get him to join. A lot of the men are more reluctant. But the Holy Spirit put us together, our four uh, couples that we have, and we have had others along the way and helped us grow in our faith and our love, and it's deepened our relationship so much, and I've fallen in love with him in such a different way, the depth of our love, and it's, the, it's also our relationship with, with Jesus. It's, it's, you know, has been a part of our marriage, and God is such an important part of our marriage. You had said earlier that there was this thing that these nuns did or that man did, this thing called adoration. Talk a bit, maybe even in the last call, the significance of that for you. Adoration is just so beautiful and I don't go enough. Um, my son, my youngest son picked an adoration time. He picked two in the morning. So <laughs> I would have to go with him because he would be tired. And he said, mom, can you please drive me and go with me? It's just so beautiful. It's sitting there and being with Jesus in 
the Blessed Sacrament, and his the host is uh, adored and glorified, and it's sitting there in that quiet and letting Jesus speak to our hearts. It's just so beautiful, and I wish more Catholics would take advantage of it, but anybody can. Any, any person who's called to go into the Catholic Church, and you can go back to where the tabernacle is, and some churches will have times of adoration, and I hope that grows more and more in our church. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the few quiet places left in the world. Where Jesus can speak to our hearts. There you go, there you go. Jan, thank you very much. Thank for you so much. joining us on the program and sharing with your own journey, as well as uh, reminding a, a lot of folk of the power of the Sacred Heart and, and uh, how that can change our lives and how we can offer that up for our family members who've drifted, you know, uh, setting them into the, the care of our Lord Jesus. So thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I, I pray that Janet's journey, Janet and Tom's journey, is an encouragement to you. Uh, the, the church has a lot to share with you to bring you closer to our Lord and to help you become more intimate with yourself to understand how God wants you to be close to Him. God bless you. See you again next week.